excited to be here. And of course, I'm giving a shameless plug to my book. The information I'm going to cover here is going to just be over three chapters because we only had 30 minutes. So let's get in and start talking about who I am to give you some background information, and then we'll dive into the presentation. So as uh, was stated, I have a PhD from University of Houston in exercise physiology. I then did a postdoc in HIV AIDS immunology at the UT Health Center in Houston. I've been a professor for a little over 10 years. And then in January, I made the switch to publishing uh, as now the senior editor for the journal Advanced Biology. I am an author of two books. The first one is Exercise Ain't Enough, Hit Honey and the Hadza. It talks about hit training and nutrition effectively. And that book can also be found on Amazon. So I'm gonna hop in here and talk about my family real quick because I think it's important for everybody to understand our background. I have a wife and daughter. This is they. We live in Dallas. Uh, we are a fit family, to say the least. The second picture here on the right is when we ran the Houston Half Marathon when my daughter Kaya was eight, and she was the youngest female entrant in that race. This was right before COVID hit. My wife comes from more of a running background, and just like you, she has MS, and that's another thing I'll be talking about in terms of some of the research that I did about swimming when we were writing this book. My daughter is very active in aquatics. So this is her playing water polo and she also swims for Dallas Mustangs and she runs cross country. Uh, she's done a number of sports. She's currently playing soccer. So this stuff that I'm going over, it's not just from the PhD that I've got. It's from years and years of experience of being an athlete myself and now also coaching and training my daughter and my wife. So my fitness backgrounds, I come from a swimming background. I swam on a scholarship at the University of Puget Sound in the mid 90s. We won the national championships in 95 and 96. Uh, after swimming for a number of years, I switched over to doing triathlon at a pretty high level. Moved on from that to ultra marathon, and then I started getting really slow. So I thought, you know, as slow as I am, I'm going to shift over and start lifting some more weights. And I put on quite a bit more mass and started doing Olympic weightlifting and what are called Highland Games. So if you're not familiar with these, it's a bunch of uh, pituitary cases that are throwing around stones and logs and having a great time with it. And recently I've come around and gone full circle doing triathlon again, but not really interested in the actual competition, more of the experience. So I work with a group called Ainsley's Angels and we pair up with a physically disabled athlete and we act as their angel. And so in this case, this is my teammate, Mei Ling. And I towed her in a rubber dinghy for 300 yards and then put her in this same contraption attached to my bike for 12 miles. And then we ran for two miles. So those are the kinds of things that I'm doing currently. And now we're gonna hop in and talk about the premise for this presentation. So the overview is that we're gonna start by talking about three special properties of water that make exercise and just existence in water very different than what you would experience if you exercise or just walk on land in air. Uh, We'll talk about the horizontal position of swimming versus being the vertical position of terrestrial exercise. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty of the book, which is how swimming is better than land-based exercise for a number of different health parameters. We'll specifically cover cardiovascular health, respiratory health, and then mental health. And then there should be plenty of time left over for questions and answers. So without further ado, let's get this party started. All right, so water is an alien environment for humans. We're not supposed to be in water in terms of existence. Certainly we can't breathe underwater. And so we notice that there's some very different, the big differences in terms of how our body responds to being in water than how it responds to being on land. So we're gonna start off with the first one, which is buoyancy. Now we're all familiar with buoyancy. If we look at this dotted line, this is where the water level was before the duck got dunked into it, okay? Gravity is pushing the duck down so that a portion of the duck is under the water. Now the volume of the duck that's under the water is equivalent to the volume of water that's displaced. That volume allows for a vertical pressure from the water on the duck, pushing it back up. Now why this is important when we think of humans getting into water is unloading the body, taking the effects of gravity off of our joints and our muscles. So if we look at the slants going into, let's say a pool, and we have this person walking in about groin depth into water, they're about 40% unloaded in terms of their total body weight. If they go into about their navel, now they're about half of their body weight is unloaded. They go into their sternum, we're at about 60%. And if you're brave enough to go all the way in 
neck deep. Now we've unloaded everything except for just the head. So the impact of this should be quite clear, but let's actually contrast this with what we would see if we had running or cycling, which are the two most common aerobic endurance exercises that we see on land. With running, we have these big impact forces with the feet hitting the ground with every single stride that we take. Up to five to seven Gs of force. So if you consider when we're standing still, that's one G. So we're increasing the amount of weight that we're carrying on our joints by five to seven times when we take a step like this. So what impact does this have? Well, it puts a lot of strain on the ankles, on the knees, the hips, and the, sp the spine as well. We can move over to cycling, which would be considered a low impact exercise. Now we're, no we're removing those hammering forces of ground impact forces, but we still have a lot of shear forces on the knees. Okay, the, the hips and the lower back are held in this position for extended periods of time, which makes it very difficult for those core muscles to hold that position if they're not very well trained. Now we contrast both of these with swimming. Okay, swimming is effectively a no impact activity. Okay, we're not really making any contact with solid surfaces aside from the start, the turn and the finish. And those are real short and they're actually minimal in terms of the actual forces that are generated relative to the other sports. Okay, so we're taking a great deal of strain off of the body. Okay, moving on to the next thing we're gonna talk about which is hydrostatic pressure. Now this basically just means water pressure on the body. So if you've ever jumped into a pool and you've submerged yourself maybe six or seven feet down, maybe in the deep end where the big diving boards are, you can start to feel some pain on your ears. Okay, well that's hydrostatic pressure. The column of water that's above you is actually pushing down on you, on your eardrums. Okay, as we get deeper into water, we experience more of that hydrostatic pressure squeezing on the body. So much so that if we get into water that's about four feet deep, which is not that very deep really, we experience about 89 millimeters of mercury of force. Now, I want you to remember this number for just a few seconds as I move on to the next slide to describe why this would be important. For most individuals who are quite healthy and have a good circulatory system, this is not gonna be that impactful. But for those who have a weaker circulatory system and suffer from what's called peripheral edema, which is effectively swelling of the lower extremities, swimming is gonna be quite important. So in this case, we have an individual who's got a lot of additional fluid that has been built up in their tissues, okay? What, what we want to see is that as blood travels down, it gets squeezed out into the tissues, which we want, because it's gonna carry nutrients, it's gonna carry water, but then we wanna see that the venous system can actually bring that back to the circulatory system. Now, there's a number of reasons why people would suffer from peripheral edema. I have some to some degree. Some of mine is from years and years of weightlifting. I've actually made the valves in my veins weaker so that I get some reflux going back down and I get a pulling of blood in my legs. Now, what we want for anybody with peripheral edema to do is exercise. But what can be problematic in land-based exercises is that when we exercise, blood pressure actually increases, which squeezes even more fluid out into these peripheral tissues. Okay, so that we can start off with a foot before exercise that looks like this, and then a foot after exercise that looks like this. Now, the common treatment for this is to wear compression garments, and these are great. I wear these all the time. But the tightest compression garments you're going to get, they'll give you about 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury of pressure, squeezing those fluids back into circulation and back up to the heart. If you go into water that's four feet deep and do some water aerobics or water jogging, you're getting 89 millimeters of mercury pressure. So almost double what you would get from compression garments. So it offers a great deal of relief from individuals who suffer from peripheral edema. So what we see here is even in an individual who's quite healthy, as they stand still, they'll get a pulling of blood in their calves and their lower extremities. We take the same person and we stand them in water, the hydrostatic pressure squeezes that fluid back into circulation and forces that fluid back up to the heart, okay? And from that, we can actually allow for this individual to work out harder, longer, because they will actually have a more efficient heart working at that moment. The third property of water that's different than air is heat transfer. All right, so we have a boiled egg that's sitting here on your counter in air, and then we take another boiled egg and we stick it into water that's the same temperature as the air. Which of these is gonna cool faster? obviously the egg that's in the water, because water can actually absorb a great deal more heat than can air. Now, why is this important? For two reasons, for unhealthy people, so we really have three populations. We have the um, frail elderly, 
we have overweight, obese, and then we have individuals with neurological diseases like MS. All of these individuals have difficulty with heat stress, okay? It's, it, they're heat intolerant in many instances. Now we want all of these populations to exercise, but if you live in a place like Dallas or anywhere in Texas or the lower half of the, the, the continental United States, it's hotter than Hades nine months out of the year and it makes it very difficult to actually do long-term exercise at high intensities on land. That's where water comes in. With swimming, you can dissipate that heat very rapidly and it keeps these individuals away from heat stress and they can work out harder, longer, which is really what we want from any exercise activity. For healthy individuals, actually this is for everybody, but for healthy individuals, this is really what you're gonna be interested in. When we hop into a pool that's like 76 to 77 degrees competition temperature and you just sit there, in short order, you're gonna be feeling cold enough that you have to shiver. So you actually have to generate additional heat above what's gonna be produced during your workout to keep your body from getting cold. Now, the great thing about this is that when you hop out of the water, you maintain that additional heat dissipation into air for hours after the workout. You do the same thing if you work out on land, but you'll do it longer and you'll do it well with greater temperature differences if you do your exercise in the water. And the key point of this is that we're burning additional calories and at rest, those calories predominantly come from fat. That's a great plus if you're actually trying to shed fat pounds. All right, the last bit of this is not really a property of water, but it's a property of being in the prone position when we're actually working out. So as we stated before, if we're standing still, we will get a pulling of blood in the lower extremities. But when we get prone, that blood is now level with the heart, which means it makes it easier for our circulatory system to return that blood to the heart. The more blood we get into the heart, the more blood we can get out. It's all about increasing the intensity of exercise and the duration of exercise in terms of magnifying the health benefits of any activity. All right, so let's go over our take home messages from this introductory portion here. Swimming is a no act impact activity. Buoyancy eliminates load from the ankles, the knees, the hips, and really importantly, the spine. Hydrostatic pressure and the prone position, both of these are gonna increase blood return to the heart and increase the efficiency of our exercise. And then of course, the thermal effects of water allow us to rapidly remove heat from the body. All of these increase the exercise intensity and duration. Now, this is going to be a theme that's going to be repeated over and over again. When we look to see or when we learn to look to gain health benefits from any activity that we do, what we really need is high intensity, the highest you can do comfortably for the longest period of time. That's why we do interval training. That's why we do HIT. If your only activity is a brief, maybe brisk walk, that's really not enough to see the, the, the great the, 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 I guess the, the true benefits of exercise. So from there, let's now hop into talking about why swimming is so great in terms of these uh, three benefits that we're gonna talk about next. So we'll start off with cardiovascular health. All right, so the cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the United States as per the CDC. We have one person dies every 34 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease. It's pretty morbid. 697,000 people in the U.S. died from heart disease in 2020. That makes one every five deaths, so 20%, very high. And aerobic exercise should be part of any preventative treatment plan in terms of preventing cardiovascular disease and most, uh, I guess, rehabilitative treatments after you've already had a heart attack. So the first president, or the first study I'm going to show you was done in 40,547 men over a longitudinal span of 37 years, or 32 years, I'm sorry. The individuals ranged from 20 to 90 in terms of their ages, and they looked at all cause mortality. So any deaths that occurred during that time, they would rack it up into their uh, statistical analyses, but the vast majority of deaths that occurred in this cohort of 40,000 men were cardiovascular deaths. So when the researchers controlled for the age of the individual, their body mass index, which is an estimation of body composition, smoking and alcohol, and are also family history of cardiovascular diseases, they got the following results. So looking at a control group that did no activity on a regular basis, they saw about 70,000, or sorry, 70 deaths per 10,000 man years is how they, they uh, did their calculations on this. When they look at the group that did regular walking, they saw that there was a small decrement in the number of the deaths. Running came down more, but then look at how much more uh, swimming actually improved the longevity of these individuals. 
less than half the number of deaths in any of the other group when you swam versus did nothing, walking, or running. Now, the researchers decided, well, the, the answer that they gave for why this actually happened was that swimming allowed for these longer, harder workouts. You're working with individuals who, in many instances, are frail and elderly or ill. Doing high-intensity activities on land is very difficult. So here we have the dog that does not want to walk, and then we have this obese dog that's running, and then we have dogs that are swimming. Okay, so swimming is going to lead to less stressful activity. Okay, you'll have less pulling of blood in the lower extremities. We'll have less heat stress, and we get more blood back to our working muscles, which will improve the intensity and duration of the workout. You're probably getting tired of hearing me say that phrase. All right, so we're going to move on to swimming for respiratory health next. Now, this is the only picture of lungs I could find related to swimming. It's a strange picture. I apologize. Lung disease is a leading ailment in the U.S. as per the American Lung Association. Nearly 37 million Americans live with chronic lung diseases, including asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. More than 25 million Americans, including over 6 million children, suffer from asthma. So just like we saw with cardiovascular disease, we want aerobic exercise to be part of any treatment plan. But in many instances, land-based activities are very difficult for those with pulmonary disorders. So before we get into the results of the studies that I'm going to present, I want to show you exactly what we're talking about when we talk about pulmonary function. If you've ever had a pulmonary function test, you'll know what I'm talking about. But this is how we test how well the respiratory muscles are at moving air in and out of the lungs. Someone will take what's called a pulmonary function test. Now, in this case, the subject is breathing into what's called a spirometer, which is a device that measures the total volume of air that you can get in and out of the lungs and then how fast it can come out. So she'll start this test by having her nose clipped off. So she's only breathing in and out through her mouth. And she'll take some normal breaths and that's called your tidal volume. So when you're sitting there resting now, listening to me, you're moving a certain amount of air in and out of your lungs, that's your tidal volume. But then the guy who's administering the test, he'll say, okay, now I want you to take as big a deep breath in as you can possibly take in as fast as you can. And at the peak of that breath, I want you to blast it all out. So that is your functional vital capacity. That is how much air you can physically move in and out of your lungs as fast as possible. So from this test, you'll get two readings. You'll get one, which is the total volume you can move, which is important. Okay, that tells you a lot about the actual health of the, the muscles that move air in and out. But just as importantly is how fast can you do it? Okay, if you can breathe in and out quickly, then you have unobstructed airways, which is great. If you have a difficult time breathing in, then you typically have inflammation or clogging of those airways, asthma. If you have a difficult time breathing out, then you may have something called COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, emphysema, where you have a difficult time evacuating air from your lungs. All right, so now that we understand what we're measuring, let's take a look at two studies. The first one was in children. So this study looked at 75 children between the ages of seven and eight who were split up into three groups equally. One was a control that did no activity. The second one did indoor soccer, and the third one did swimming. The last two activity groups, they did their activities twice a week for four months. They measured inspiratory and expiratory pressure. So how much pressure can the respiratory muscles generate when they're moving air? So this is akin to a one rep max for your respiratory muscles. All right, and so what we see here is that the indoor soccer group after four months looked no different than it did before, and it looked no different from the control group. But look at the swimming group. These kids made major uh, improvements in their inspiratory and expiratory pressures over a very short period of time. Now, I'll briefly discuss what the reason is for this and the difference between these. If you think about soccer, that activity is entirely legs. So it's not really working any part of the upper body. Whereas swimming is almost entirely upper body. And you might have a little bit of kick that's only gonna add about 20% in terms of your propulsive force. So it's really a difference between upper versus lower bodies. Now, this isn't children who are growing, obviously. We would expect that there to be an increase in their lung capacities over time, just as they get bigger. What about if we take adults and look at them once they're fully grown? So in this case, this study looked at men between the ages of 20 and 45, and this was a cross-sectional study. They had four groups, non-swimmers, people who had been swimming for less than two years, between two and five years, and for more than five years. And what they measured here was that max volume of air that you can move in and out in a single breath. What they saw was that after two years of swimming, there's not much difference there in terms of how much air you can actually move in and out. 
but we start to see significant improvements between two and five years. And by five years, it's a huge improvement. All right, so what's the take home message from this? Well, let's look at the big headlines. Swimming produces similar results in young and old. That's what we want to see from an activity. If it's something that's only gonna be uh, applicable to one age group, then it's not very useful generally for the entire population. But in this case, we're seeing that it is actually quite useful for everybody. So in red, it's never too late to start swimming. No matter how old you are, you're gonna derive health benefits from hopping into a water or into a tank and doing some swimming. So how does swimming improve our respiratory function? Well, we're gonna get passive strengthening of our respiratory muscles from the hydrostatic pressure. So let's think about this. If we're standing in water and we're breathing, we have a force that's pushing in on our ribs and we have to push it back out. So it's like our respiratory muscles are actually doing weightlifting. And that makes them a great deal stronger in terms, especially in terms of inhaling air. Now, here's another really key point that's different between swimming and every other type of sport is that we hold our breath when we swim. Even if you're a great swimmer and you've got your breathing patterns down tight, when your face is in the water, you're holding your breath, which makes you slightly hypoxic, which means you're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide and lactic acid in the blood. And these two chemicals in your blood have shown to be very, very potent stimulators of physical adaptations to respiratory health. Particularly, they drive the brain to tell those muscles to contract harder to move air in and out. And then the last point is that, as we stated before, swimming is an upper uh, half of your body sport. So we use big muscles like the latissimus dorsi back here to pull down and the pectoral muscles and your abdominal muscles. All of these are active while you're actually swimming. So they get stronger for swimming purposes but they all have a secondary benefit in them as much as these muscles are also responsible for helping us breathe while we're exercising. So these muscles are effectively pulling double duty, okay? And that is something you don't see in land-based exercises because almost all of those are leg-driven. All right, so we're gonna move on to our last bit here and we're gonna talk about swimming and mental health. Anxiety is, oh, I've got this blocking me here. The most commonly diagnosed mental health disorder in the United States, about 19% of Americans suffer from some form of anxiety. Anxiety is associated with an overactive symp sympathetic nervous system and also reduced parasympathetic nervous system activity. And the goal of any treatment is to reverse this imbalance. So what am I talking about when we talk about these two portions of our autonomic nervous system? Well, let's take a look at this. The autonomic nervous system is the part of our brain that we don't control its activities. So we have the somatic nervous system, which controls my muscle movements and my talk and my thought, but autonomic happens immediately without us having to think about it. And we subdivide that into two portions. The first one is the sympathetic nervous system, which runs our fight or flight responses. So in this case, the caveman is running away from the saber tooth tiger. And then once he's gotten away from this uh, threat, hopefully the parasympathetic nervous system will kick in and say, okay, let's bring everything back down to homeostasis. We need you to rest and digest. So exercise is a fight or flight response. Now remember, exercise in its modern form is only 150, 200 years old. Nobody prior to that went for a run. It was unheard of because you were working in a field all day or you were a blacksmith or whatever the case may be. That was exercise. So let's take a look at what kind of activities we would get from each of these portions of our autonomic nervous system. If we have a sympathetic fight or flight response, our pupils are gonna dilate so we can take in more information from our external environment to see if there's a threat coming. We're gonna get an increase in our heart rate and then also the force with which our heart contracts. We're gonna clear our respiratory ways by bronchodilation so we can get more air in and out. And then we're gonna reduce blood flow to our stomach and our kidneys, because at that moment in time, we really don't care about digesting our last meal, we gotta get away. Once we've gotten away, then we're gonna do the opposite. Our, our, the parasympathetic nervous system is gonna constrict our pupils, slow down our heart rate, constrict our airways, and then we're gonna go back to providing blood flow to our digestive system so that we can assimilate the foods that we just ate. In an individual who has anxiety, the sympathetic nervous system is talking way too much. Okay, and the objective is to actually get it to quiet down. Now, this is not swimming per se, but it is an aquatic activity. So let's look at the next slide here. This is what's called sensory deprivation. Now I've done this and I love it. You go into a tank 
The ones that I've been in, it's like you have a pod where they pull the lid down on top of you, but in, in a population of anxious individuals, I'm sure they probably did not want to do that part. In this case, it's an open tank and it's filled with brine, salty water, which allows you to float more than you would in just um, non-salty water, in fresh water. So in this case, in this study, they took 50 or 80 individuals, 50 subjects with anxiety and 30 non-anxious controls, and they allowed them to float in one of these sensory deprivation tanks for one hour. They took measures of um, the negative uh, aspects of uh, anxiety, and then what you would consider, I guess, a parasympathetic response on the other end, the positive or in blue. And there's more than just these, but for example, they took measures, and these were um, questionnaires on pain, fatigue, sleep, the feelings of serenity, energy, and happiness. Now, the results are amazing. You just don't see results like this in biological studies in humans. These changes are dramatic, so much so that the group that was suffering from anxiety looked almost exactly like their non-anxious peers in the control group after the one hour. Okay, so fatigue was decreased, sleepiness decreased, depression went down. They felt a great deal more refreshed afterwards. They felt serene. They had energy and happiness, just the things that we would be looking for. So the quick question here is how does this work? Well, hydrostatic pressure is gonna play a big role here. Okay, so as we squeeze on the body, we shift blood back into the heart. And if we have more blood coming back into the heart, we're gonna reduce heart rate. Okay, so we're giving the, the, the nervous system a signal that's just basic that says, it's okay to calm down now. Okay, so SNS activity goes down and PNS activity goes up. And this lasts for hours after you come out of the pool or come out of the sensory deprivation tank. So what I think is happening here is that water is giving us a big warm hug. And now I'm gonna go into this little story about when I was writing this paper, book. I was about halfway through writing this section and I happened to cross a movie about a person I'd never heard of before. Her name is Temple Grandine and the movie is eponymously titled Temple Grandine and the character was played by Claire Danes. Now Temple Grandine is an engineer who works in the livestock industry and she's designed a number of ways of corralling and unfortunately slaughtering animals that are more humane than what was happening before. She also happens to be autistic. Now in her story, she described one day when she was at her aunt's house and she was watching them take the calves and vaccinate them. And they would put them into a chute, which had a V like this that would clamp around them and hold them still while they got a shot. She noticed that when they went in, they were agitated, which makes sense. They're separated from their mom and they're going to be stuck with this big, horrible needle. But as soon as that clamped around them, they calmed down. Now, she knew for herself that she very much wanted to be hugged, but she couldn't stand the touch of other humans. So she de devised this device called a hug box. And she made this in her college dorm room. It's the same basic premise here, two planks of wood in a V shape that had mattresses on either side that she would lay in and she would pull on that rope that was attached to a set of pulleys that would clamp on her in a sustained control press that felt like having a hug. It would calm down her nerves. Part of this is also just like hydrostatic pressure. It, it actually reduces sympathetic nervous activity. All right, so take home messages from this presentation. Swimming is a dynamic form of exercise that improves health and well being. It improves cardiovascular and respiratory function, it improves mood. And I didn't touch on this, but it's in the book. It improves cognitive function as well. In other words, it makes it so that we can learn better immediately after swimming. There is even evidence that just having a public pool in your neighborhood improves the mental health and well being of the surrounding community. So it's a fascinating topic. And look at all these other things that are covered in the book that we didn't even touch. So I highly recommend you reach out and grab this one, 20 bucks on Amazon or wherever you buy books, available on October 25th. Okay, that's pretty sad. No more plugging the book. I'm gonna open it up to questions now. Awesome. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time, but I am gonna give you two if you can answer really quick. You bet. Dr. Hutchison, let's see. So the first one was, is it true you should wait after eating? No, that is not time. true. <laughs> okay. So the old wives tale was that, you know, so if you wait, if you eat, you're going to have a shunting of blood to your gut that's going to go away from your, your muscles. When you get into the water, they're going to cramp. But the research just it does not happen. Now, if you're going to feel a little queasy, I wouldn't go in the water and do a hard workout. But if you just got done eating a hot dog and you're at a barbecue, you can hop in the tank and you'll be just fine. Okay, awesome. Next question. 
Should I swim formal laps or just splash around or a kickboard or what to get a benefit? That's going to be entirely up to each individual person. Uh, what I would say is that if you're interested in you know, really getting into shape, you need to have a tailored workout that's going to be a little bit more than just splashing around. You want it to be as directed and focused as you would for any other type of workout. Now, if you just want to get in and, and experience being in the water, then just do what it is that you feel most comfortable doing. Awesome. Okay. So we're at the end of our time. However, that was an amazing presentation. Oh my God. I love swimming. I'm going to swim even more. I'm going to go swim when we're done here. Okay. Where can people reach you? How can they get a hold of you? Okay. So it is Latin Scotsman at gmail.com. Latin Scotsman. At gmail.